So we're in our sixth week of this series, What's Up Church? What we need to learn from the seven churches in Revelation. And today we're going to deal with our fifth church, and that is the church in Sardis. And we're going to ask ourselves this question, What's Up Church? Are we a dead church? So we're going to start with Sardis and check out the background of Sardis. They're number five on our little map here. And here's some facts about Sardis. It was located near the Pactolus River. And uh, there was deposits of gold in that river, which made this uh, city one of the richest cities. Um, they first minted gold and silver into coins to sit in this city. And uh, the church was probably founded during Paul's ministry in Acts chapter 19. Again, we don't see this church within Acts, but in Acts 19, it says for two years, all of uh, the, the uh, province of Asia heard the gospel through that ministry. So what we're going to do now is we're going to jump right in. And in Revelation 3, verse 1, it says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. If you remember way back when to the first uh, message in the series, when we studied Revelation chapter 1, we identified the seven spirits. Remember when, when, uh, when John turned around and he saw Jesus and he had the seven spirits and, um, and the seven stars. Um, the seven spirits were known as the, the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit as found in Isaiah chapter 11. And the seven stars were most likely the messengers to those churches. So they were the pastors or leaders of those churches. So that's the identity of Christ. And then we get right into the meat of it. And he says this, I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So Jesus says to them, hey, listen, I know you're doing good things. I know that the people around that church see a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It seems to be that this was a church that was doing good things. And in fact, they were doing enough good things that the people in the community saw them and said, wow, they're alive. But Jesus actually says, you are dead. So what in the world is going on here? I mean, this is kind of a weird uh, church, right? I know your works. It seems like you're alive. People have a reputation. People around are saying, oh, there is a church that's alive. And Jesus is saying, you are dead. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is Jesus talking about? Well, what would a dead church be? Well, what is a dead church? So that's the question we're going to answer. And the, the, um, the answer to that question, I believe, is this. A dead church is one that is doing religious things, but has no saving faith in Jesus. A dead church is one that is doing religious things, but has no saving faith in Jesus. That means that this church, by and large, does not believe that Jesus is the Savior, that they are all sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior who died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, and three days later rose again to prove that He was God. They don't believe that. So this is what a dead church looks like. So now, before we go into any further into this passage, there is something I have to warn us about, okay? So we're going to study what is a dead church, and, you know, we're going we're gonna to see, like, you know, are we a dead church? We're going to evaluate ourselves. What we cannot do is we cannot judge this for other people, meaning this. We can't go around pointing at people and their churches saying, dead church, dead church, dead church, okay? We can't do that, okay? The Lord can do this because He knows their hearts, okay? He knows their hearts. He knows our hearts. But for us, here's what we can do. We can look at our church and look at ourselves, the way we worship and the ministries that we do and stuff like that, and we could say, you know what? Are we a dead church? Okay, Are we dead? Are we going through the motions? So we can evaluate ourselves and make sure that we're not on this road to death, basically. So here's, here's what happens to me. A lot of people, like when I'm talking to them, of course, you know, as a guy, people always say this. What do you do? Okay. And, you know, game's always on when I'm like, I'm a pastor. Okay. It's like game's on. We're going to have this conversation now. And usually I'll say I'm a pastor and people will say something along these lines. I really should get to church. Okay. <laughs> That's what they'll say. Or I should get back to church. 
Now, oftentimes they're very surprised at what my answer is or how I respond to that because I normally say something along these lines. It's really not about getting to church. It's about what you believe about Jesus. You see how that transitions the conversation into something that is really important? Okay, because I could say, oh yeah, you should get back to church. We have 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. You know what I mean? I can explain all the things that... But what real purpose is that going to have? Because realistically, here's what happens. People say, I really should get back to church. And then if you tell them, oh yeah, my church, this and that, or you know, our church meets at this time or whatever, the, the step for them to actually do that it could be months, if not years off. My purpose in talking to this person is not to get them to church. My purpose is to see that individual come to know who Jesus is. You and I both know this to be true. When you come to know who Jesus is, the Holy Spirit has you doing things that you never thought you would do. I remember when I first became a Christian, or right before I became a Christian, it was like the Holy Spirit was knocking on my door, and I was like, I want to go to church, which is something I never said when we were younger. When we were younger, we grew up in a church, and about 11 years old, my mom decided we weren't going there anymore. Me and my brother were like, yes, high five. You don't have to go to church anymore. So the thought of going to a church was so far from my mind until the Holy Spirit was really knocking on my door. So here's what happens. This brings us to the question as, of how does a church die? Because if we're dealing with dead churches and not focusing on the right thing, how does a church die? Well, I believe this is the way a church dies. When it loses focus of Jesus and the gospel message. When it loses focus of the fact that Jesus did, in fact, die for us, that Jesus did rise from the dead, that all who believe will have eternal life, when the church loses the focus, when the focus is not on that any longer, guess what? The church starts to die, okay? And it's on the road to death. When you come here each Sunday, right, you hear the gospel message. And some of you are like, okay, here's the part where he tells us about Jesus and he died on the cross for our sins. I hope you never feel like that. I hope you realize that the reason why I do that is, one, because there's always going to be people that walk through these doors that don't know who Jesus is, that needs to believe in Jesus. But two, we need to be reminded every week what our purpose is. My purpose is to serve the one who died for me. And when I'm reminded of that every day of my life and every Sunday, Jesus died for me. I wouldn't be here today if Jesus didn't die for me. I wouldn't have the life I have if Jesus didn't die for me. It's the constant focus of our church. So how does a church die? When it loses that focus. When it doesn't focus on that anymore. So what are some of the common things? Now, this is just a list of four things. There might be a lot more things, but this is a list of four things that I came up with that in my perception that we can kind of see how churches get off focus. So here are some common reasons church, churches lose focus. The first is this, worship style. Some people get so caught up in their worship style, whether it's a ritualistic, liturgical type style, whether it's an experiential type style, whether it's a hands up, whether it's a hands down. Here's the thing. If our focus too much is on how we express our worship, here's what happens. Our focus gets off the one that we're supposed to be worshiping, and it gets on how I like to worship, okay? How I like to worship, my preferences. So churches some, sometimes do this, and sometimes people walk right into a gospel-centered church, don't like the worship, and then walk out because they're like, I want something a little different. And they search around for something a little different, and guess what? They get off focus. And not only that, sometimes churches put so much time and effort into expressing worship that they forget who they're worshiping. The next is churches that focus in on what they are against. You know what? Sometimes churches fall into this trap, right? Always talking about what we're against. Our culture is so far from God. I don't like this. This is what the world has to offer. Against, 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 against. And here's what happens. When we start to do that, we start to lose focus. Because here's what happens. When, you, when we focus only on what we're against, we start to have like a little bit of hatred towards what we're against. And we know God hates sin, okay? But what does God love? He loves people. And if we start to look at our church and the things that we're against consistently, what it does is it breeds like an angry mob of people that are running around with torches, okay? And saying, this is what we're against. This is what we're against. This is what we're against. And we forget what we're for, which is bringing 
the people the gospel message, which is bringing the gospel message. The next thing is this. Sometimes churches focus in on what they do. Okay, churches get so caught up in their programs, their activities, the good things that they do, okay? The good things that we do. They become so consumed with doing these things that it becomes the focus of the church. It becomes the focus of the church. This is what we do. This is what we do. We have this. We have that. We have this. And these are all good things, right? These are all good things. But if we start to just do activities for the sake of activities, what happens? What happens? I remember when I was a youth pastor and I was still in college. I was probably about 20, 21 years old. And I was talking to one of my friends in one of my classes. And I was like planning out a calendar. I was looking at the calendar. And I said to him, I was like, oh, I, I need some activities or events to like, fill the calendar. I was a brand new youth pastor. And the, the kid sitting next to me, his name was Scott. He goes like this. He goes, well, what's the purpose of it? I was like, well, I, I just want to do something, you know, because that's what I do. I'm a youth pastor. I got like, activities. And he was like, man. He's like, no. He's like, it's got to have a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, what's the sense of doing it? What is really the sense of doing it? And the truth be told is, that is true, okay? We can't just do things for the sake of doing things. We have to remember why we do things. And here's what happens. When we start doing things for the sake of doing things, then they're relatively successful. We start to be very prideful. Our church does this. Our church does that. We're so great. Which brings us into the next thing, the way churches can lose focus is just simply promoting themselves. Promoting themselves. You know what? We live in a social media saturated world, right? And guess what? People are on social media, so we as believers should be there to some degree to preach the gospel to them. But you know what? Now in the church culture, and I read like a lot, a lot of articles and different things and books, and you know, a lot of times they're like, oh, you got to promote the church. You got to brand the church. It's like a business. You got to get out there into the world. And you know, and I read those things and I'm like, ugh, that's, the church isn't a business. The church is a place for us to focus on who Jesus is. And obviously there's going to be some things that we have to do to get the word out of what's going on so that people hear, so that you hear. But if we get too caught up in that, it becomes where Forked River Baptist Church, look at us. Whereas really what we should be saying is there's Jesus, look at him. He's the one that saves you. So we're not sure about this church in Sardis, if they fell into any of these categories. But what we are sure about is this. The Lord says to them, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So people in the community are saying, they're alive, but the Lord himself, who knows their hearts, is saying, you're dead. So this is where it gets tricky because it seems like there is life because there's dedication, there's commitment, there's religious experience. But the focus apparently in this church is not on the Lord. It is on other things. So as I was praying and thinking about this, this church, I'll just, I'll just tell you this. You know, when I do a topical message series, you know, I'm like, oh, this is a good topic, this is a good topic, this is a good topic. I would never pick this as a topic. I wouldn't be like, let's talk about dead church, okay? I wouldn't pick this. But this is a topic that I'm dealt, I'm dealt with in the scriptures. So here's the truth. I had to really think and pray about what is the best example in the scriptures of people that appear to be alive but are actually dead? And some of you know the answer to this. It is the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes and the Pharisees were religious leaders of that day that appeared to be alive to everybody around, but Jesus himself calls them out, and here's what he says. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Now, these are like the grand poobahs of the religion now, okay? Of the Jewish faith. Jesus calls them out and says, guess what, guys? You're full of dead people's bones. You're dead inside. You look amazing on the outside. Everybody thinks that you are these people that they should be following. And guess what? You are dead. 
Notice where this is, Matthew 23. The crucifixion happens really quick after this, okay? Because Jesus obviously was going to be under a huge scrutiny calling out the religious leaders. But you know what? If we focus on the things that I talked about, we could fall into the same trap as these religious leaders, okay? Preaching something, our church, our activities, what we do, self-promotion, and forgetting about a message that actually brings life. But interestingly enough, when Jesus deals with these Pharisees, if we back up in Matthew chapter 23, this is what he says to the crowds and disciples. This is what he says to the people that are following after him. The disciples were probably, for all intents and purposes, they were believers at that time. And it says this, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, meaning they teach the law of Moses. So do and observe what they tell you. And then he says this, but not the works they do, for they preach, but do not practice. So now Jesus is saying, hey, listen, you know what? The things that they're telling you to do are good things. Do those things, but don't live like them. Don't live like them because they are full of dead people's bones. Jesus continues in this passage to tell them, you know what? This is the reason. If you read through Matthew 23, he actually says, the reason why these guys do what they do is they just want to look good for other people. That's what Jesus does. He calls them out, knows their heart. He calls them out and he says, they're only doing these things because they just want to look good. That should never happen in the church. We should not only do things because we want to look good for the people outside these walls or even for one another. We should do the things that the Lord calls us to do because we love the Lord and want to serve the Lord. So this brings us to the council to this spiritually dead church. And now this is, the council is really, it starts off kind of really strong to the non-believer. But, but I believe this, as believers we can apply this to ourselves. Because if you are a believer in Christ, okay, you can apply all these truths to your own life. So let's look at the council. The first is wake up. Wake up is what the scriptures tell us. Wake up. The spiritually dead need to wake up. To the believers that are off focus, we need to wake up. Here's what Ephesians 5 says. Ephesians 5 says this. But when anything is exposed by the light, it will become visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Do you know what the truth is about our lives? Jesus knows our hearts. He knows that we're sinners. He knows that we need him. So if you are a sinner, which we all are, and you haven't trusted in Jesus, what Jesus is saying is, wake up. Wake up. I'm shining the light on your sin. You need me. Wake up. If you are not a believer in Christ yet, you need to wake up. If you are a believer and you're going the wrong way, you need to wake up. Guess what? The light's going to shine on that sin. Jesus knows what's going on in your life. He's saying, don't continue to go that way. Wake up. The next that he says in this passage is, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Now, this is a call to rescue and help those that are in the church. They are not experiencing total death yet, right? Because they're still physically alive. So if the Lord is talking to this church in Sardis, he's saying, strengthen what remains that's about to die. These people, they're going to die, okay? They're going to die. Physically, we're all going to die. And he's saying, you know what? They're not dead yet, so they need me. They need to hear my message. They're probably feeling the weight of their sin, their lack of purpose in life because they're not looking to the Lord for salvation. And guess what? They came to church because we have a reputation of being alive. But you know what? They don't need a religious experience. They don't need to hear about what we're against. They don't need to, for us to give them another activity to do for their family. And they don't need us to tell them how great our church is doing. They don't need that. Do you know what they need? They need Jesus. Okay? They need Jesus. We can focus in on all those other things and pat ourselves on the back or, or you know, talk about how great this is going or that's going, but is that going to save anybody? 
That's not going to save anybody. We need to focus on the gospel message and strengthen what remains. Notice what the Lord says here in Isaiah 40, 31. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Not they who come to a good church. They who have good activities. They who have a good social media presence will renew their strength. Okay, They who wait on the Lord. The Lord is the one who gives us strength. Okay, if our focus isn't on the Lord, and some of you may have been to churches that the focus is not on the Lord anymore, and you're just like, what am I even doing here? Let me just tell you, if you move from this community and you need to find a church, and you walk in and the focus is not on the Lord, just go look for another church, okay? Because you're going to wind up down a slippery slope to doing things and being involved in things that really have no real power or purpose in this life. The next thing, the next counsel is this. I have not found your works complete. Now, you remember he said this. I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive. So basically, obviously, there were some good works. But now he's saying, okay, these works are not complete. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, there's a passage in John chapter 6. Some of you might remember this. And you might have learned this in Sunday school when you were a little kid. Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. Do you remember that? Okay. And then after they, he fed all those people, they collected like 12 baskets of leftovers. There was more leftovers than Jesus started with. He obviously performed a miracle. After that, the disciples got in a boat. They started to cross the Sea of Galilee. And then Jesus caught up with them. Remember how Jesus caught up with them? He invented the outboard motor, put it on a little boat, and was like, Nyeh. no. He got on the water, right? And he started walking on the water. He caught up with them, got in the boat. Then they all went across. Finally, all the crowds came and found Jesus and his followers. They found Jesus and his followers. The crowd eventually caught up to Jesus and said to them, Jesus said this to them, okay? Jesus wasn't like, cool, I'm glad you guys found me. Jesus actually looked at them and said, you are all only following after me or looking for me because I fed you. Your stomachs were filled because they were part of the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. Jesus calls this whole crowd out. Now think about it. The Lord of this universe. Imagine you were in that crowd. You're like, there's Jesus. And he's like, you guys were just following me because you were hungry and you're in your stomach. What's going on here? So then Jesus answers them in uh, John 6. He says this, do not work, meaning they were working, trying to find Jesus. Do not work for food that perishes but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do? This is so important. You've got to pay close attention to this. What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered him, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. You know what Jesus is saying? This is the, this is the work. That you believe. It's not by doing good things. It's not by working your way into salvation. It's that you believe in him who he sent. You believe in God. Believe in Christ that he died for you. You know what? If we make all those other things the focus, then people will come to church and they're confused. They're like, what's this all about? Like, oh, okay. You know, people, a lot of times people come when they're brand new to the church. First week, they walk in and they say this to me at the door. And, and please don't take offense to this to anybody who's done this, okay? But I, I understand why you're doing this, okay? But they'll come right up to me and be like, how do I become a member, okay? And I'm like, no, don't worry about that now, okay? Don't worry about church membership, <laughs> Like, you need to trust Jesus, okay? That's the first step. Like, I don't know you. You don't know us. I don't know what you believe. But here's what you need to do. You need to sit and hear the message and come to Jesus. Because guess what? If we make all those other things the focus, and then we create this good place, sometimes people miss the real message if our focus is on all those other things. So then he goes on in the council. So complete the work is believing, obviously. And then remember what you have received and heard. So the Lord is saying to them, you know what? Remember the gospel. Remember, that, that's how the church started. You know what? No church ever starts without, a gospel pre without the gospel present. No church will continue without the gospel being present. <coughs> then he goes on and says, keep it. Okay, Meaning we should obey the truth. Teach the gospel to other people. Keep that the focus. And then 
Repent. If you're, not, if, if you're not a believer, you need to repent, meaning change your mind and your direction about who Jesus is and what you believe. But if you are a believer and you're off focus, you need to change your mind and say, hey, you know what? we got to get back on focus here. We've got off focus. We're doing activities. We're doing things. We're promoting ourselves, this and that. But it really doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. It has everything to do with us and starting a business and having a good social media footprint and all these different things. So he's saying, repent. Change your mind about that. But here is the interesting thing. Then the Lord tells us the result. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. You know what that's saying? If you will not wake up, remember, wake up to the unbeliever. Guess what? Jesus is coming back, okay? Jesus is coming back. And it says he'll come like a thief, meaning we don't know the day or hour. And every time I talk about this, I say something along these lines. Do we really believe it could be today? Do you believe it could be today? I know this morning when I was looking at my little calendar, I was like, ooh, daylight savings is in two weeks, okay? And Jesus could be saying, two weeks ain't going to come, okay? Because here's what's going to happen. I'm going to come back and bring you home, okay? But here's the truth. If you're not a believer in Christ, Jesus will come back, rapture the church, and the tribulation will start, okay? And he's saying, wake up, because if you don't, you're going to be part of that, and you don't want to be part of that. So that's the result. But then the Lord gives an encouragement. He says this. You still have a few names in Sardis. People have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. You know what? Even in a dead church, there are some true believers. And even in this church in Sardis, there were some true believers. Okay, They were probably a small group, but they were true believers, and they were worthy because they trusted in Jesus. Evidence of their faith is that they were not led astray by the rest of the church. Because here's, here's what happens. When the church starts to go the wrong way, it's easy to lead all the people astray. That's why solid biblical teaching has to happen all the time. Because guess what? If I and the leadership start to go astray, that's where the church rises up and says, like, Pastor Mike, what's going on here? Why are we doing this? Why are we not preaching the gospel anymore? Why are we watering things down? Why are we trying to appeal to the culture more than focus in on the truth of the scriptures? So the truth is, there's always going to be that small contingent of people that are in a dead church that are true believers. And he's saying, you know what? I know you guys. And guess what? Guess what? I have some promises for you. Now remember, in all of the churches, the promises are not contingent on how obedient. Meaning this, the promises don't get canceled out if the people decide not to change. If the people decide to continue to go their way. Now this is talking to believers, but these are the promises to the believers. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and, will nev and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The promise here is this, eternal security. I love this, one of my favorite topics, because I know I'm secure. I know that when I leave this earth, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord, because the Scriptures tells me this, He will never blot my name out of the book. He'll never blot your name out of the book. You can't lose your salvation. You ever walk into a church and they're preaching that you can lose your salvation? That there's something you can do to lose your salvation? You just remember this. There's nothing you did to gain your salvation. Jesus is the one who died for you. He's the one that before his father and his angels will confess you because of his bloodshed. He's the one who died for you. We are eternal, uh, eternally secure. John 10 talks about this. Ephesians 4 talks about this. The good news is that when we trust in Jesus, we are secure in Jesus for eternity. It's not because of our good works. It's not because we go to church. It's because Jesus loves us and he died for us. And when we trust him, he promises us eternity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day, and we're thankful for the message to the church in Sardis, even though it was a sad day to hear that their church, by and large, was dead. We can learn how to keep our focus on the life that you've given us through your son, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.